Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people here this evening and I think that's testament to the important nature of the subject and to the significant contribution that our speaker Liam Byrne has made to it through his new book on wealth inequality. I'm Karen Rowlingson, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences here at York and Professor of Social Policy. The subject of wealth inequality and wealth taxation have been part of my own research focus over the years, so I'm particularly pleased to be chairing this event tonight, which is part of the university's open lecture series. So, um, now let me introduce our key speaker, the Right Honourable Liam Byrne, who's been Member of Parliament since 2004 for the constituency of Hodge Hill in Birmingham, one of the most income-deprived areas in Britain. Liam served in a number of ministerial roles under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, most notably as Chief Secretary to the Treasury from 2009 to 2010. He is currently Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Inclusive Growth, a subject that goes right to the heart of the mission of our new School for Business and Society. And can I see if there are members, staff, students from this, the school here today? I can see one there, John Hudson. There's a few around. Great to have you here. It's a great new school with a great new mission. So thanks for coming. Liam has had many other roles, of course, and among these, beyond Parliament, he is an honorary professor of social science at the University of Birmingham. So Liam is extremely well qualified to make this important contribution to debate about wealth inequality through his book, which explores why wealth inequality has grown so fast in recent years and the impact that this divide has had on society and the economy. And that's a subject that Kate Pickett, our second speaker, has written extensively about, including in the award-winning and best-selling book, The Spirit Level. Kate is Professor of Epidemiology here at the University of York and Academic Co-Director of, of Health Equity North. Liam's book also takes a further step in the debate to ask how we can tackle the problem of wealth inequality and he offers a veritable smorgasbord of policy suggestions including introducing an essentials guarantee at the bottom of the economic distribution while at the same time curbing excessive salaries and profits at the top. The book also discusses ideas such as a sovereign wealth fund and a citizen's wealth fund, and also discusses issues of taxation of the wealthy. I found the book so convincing that the only question I had left was why other politicians have not yet fully embraced these ideas and policies. I do hope you enjoy the talk, and if you'd like to get your own copy of Liam's book, they will be on sale in the foyer at the end as part of our drinks reception, and Liam will be happy to do some book signings, so we'd be delighted if he joined us for that. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Liam, who will talk for about 20 minutes, and then Kate will come on um, in front and discuss with Liam her thoughts on the book, and then we'll take questions from you. So I will then come at the end and, and wrap up. But with no further, ado, uh, further delay, please join me in warmly welcoming Liam Byrne. Thank you. Um, thank, Karen, thank you so much. It's, it's a huge privilege and, and, a, and a pleasure to be here in York tonight, not simply to talk to you about this great new book available in all good bookshops uh, and indeed outside, um, but to say a huge thank you to, to those to who I owe such enormous intellectual debts, not simply Karen, uh, but also Kate and Richard uh, and many people who are involved in public life and public policy uh, here in York. York for so many years now has been a fountainhead of progressive policy making and it's a tradition that organisations like JRF are really continuing to set new standards for um, today. So I really don't want to talk for, for too long today. Westminster is full of politicians who talk far too long. I've got friends I've not spoken to for days simply because I didn't want to interrupt them. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to talk for about 20 minutes, which is, as we say at work is the average lifespan of a Tory Chancellor. And what I'd like to do is to just give you a very quick overview. I just want to set the stage uh, with some of the ideas um, from today. And as, as much as anything else, I want to provoke you. Uh, and the joy of writing books is talking about books. And this book is deliberately written as a provocation for a debate that I think that we've got to have in a really serious way together um, as a country. Now, we, of course, uh, have been writing books about the wealth of our nation for a very long time. Uh, so, as many of you will know, this is Adam Smith. 
Uh, Wealth of Nations came out about 248 years ago uh, this month. But you were good enough to laugh a minute ago, but you know, the funny thing is, if we went out into the street here today, onto your beautiful campus, and asked people what the wealth of our nation was today, I'm not sure that many people could actually answer that question. And that is because the wealth of our country has multiplied in such an extraordinary way. Now, um, I was born in 1970 in the holy town of Warrington. Um, this, is, this is about the, the earliest childhood photo I have of me, as you can see, just getting ready uh, to train for Liverpool Football Club, 13 miles away uh, from where I was born. Um, and I was born to um, a family, into a family of um, student radicals from the 1960s. My mum and dad, there uh, together in Glasgow, um, met through the anti-apartheid movement, charging onto rugby pitches to stop the Springboks playing in the 1960s. And they were part of an extraordinary generation of people who thought that you could build a genuinely more progressive society and went into public service, went into public life, full of good intentions about building a different kind of future. And so I grew up, I was lucky enough to grow up in a family that cared profoundly about inequality and believed that politics was an important uh, discipline in which people should get involved if they wanted to change things seriously. And, you know, the... The funny thing is, is that since I was born, back in 1970, the wealth of our country has multiplied by an extraordinary hundred times. Now, I don't think those two things are related, but what you will have noticed um, on this graph are a couple of interesting points on the timeline. Not least, that point around about the financial crash. Since the financial crash, the wealth of our country has, multi has almost doubled. And I don't know about you, but I don't know many people in our country who feel like their wealth has doubled since the financial crash. And here is the inconvenient truth behind these figures. The inconvenient truth is that um, if you think about this wealth, it's hard to get your, it's hard to get your head around quite how much 12 trillion pounds is, but broadly speaking, if you take that standard unit of measurement, the distance between John O'Groats and Land's End, 12 trillion pounds could pave you a path of gold bars about five and a half bars wide from John O'Groats to Land's End. That's how much 12.2 trillion pounds is at the current price of gold. But for most of my life, the way that we shared that wealth was getting fairer. But from 2010, something began to change. In fact, from 2010, the wealth of the richest 1% has multiplied by 31 times more than everybody else. The wealth inequality that we have in this country is now getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so things are now so bad that we're almost at a Roman level of inequality. One of the joys of writing this book was to be able to read um, a tremendous amount of the literature about inequality, including the spirit level, obviously. Um, and one of the favourite books that I came across was by Walter Schneidel, who makes the point that back in the days of the Romans, richest Roman fortunes were about one and a half million times the size of the average wage uh, in Rome. But now look at where we are. If you take the wealth of the Hindujas, that is now 1.3 million times the size of the average median wage here in the UK. So at their most extreme, we are uh, at almost a Roman level uh, of inequality. Now, Walter's point is a bit depressing. Um, it's not a happy read, because his conclusion is that if you look over the long wave of history, Basically, there's only two ways that you can fix this level of inequality. You can have a war, uh, or you can have a revolution. And those are your options. And let's be honest, I mean, there are people in Westminster who advocate either of those paths. Some people advocate both of those paths um, at the same time. My view, and the reason for writing this book, is that surely there must be a middle way between war and revolution. Surely good people come together 
to refashion a coherent amity that could help us design a reformation. And the debate that we need as a country is what does that reformation look like and how are we going to advance it together through the ballot box. Now, what is interesting is that people know something's up. So how many people here watched Succession? Got a few people, White Lotus? Got any fans of the Gilded Age? Above Deck, Below Deck? <laughs> so, uh, Parasite? Okay, Parasite, it looks like it's one. Um, but what is curious about this is the amount of our culture, some call it wealth porn, this kind of new genre where you have got extraordinary amounts of programming about the gap between rich and poor. And this isn't a surprise. If you go back through evolutionary history, the way that we've dealt with upstartish behavior is through choreographed mockery. And that is what our culture is doing right now. But our culture is trying to tell us something. Our culture is trying to tell us that something is wrong. And this is the polling that proves it. Four years ago, four or five years ago, I ran a poll where I asked what, who is the most powerful people in Britain today? And um, as you can see, um, it's the dark blue bars. Back in 2018, most people thought that national governments were the most powerful forces in the country. But look, look at what's happened in just five years. In just five years, the polling numbers have changed. Now, people think the top 1% are more powerful than national governments. And when we run the poll forward and say, look, what do you think it's going to be like in a few years' time? The numbers are basically the same. More and more people think that the top 1% will be more powerful even than national governments. And of course, when you ask people what they fear about that, people say unfair influence on government and rising levels of corruption. And so this, these kind of cultural signals that you're seeing on the telly and streaming, it's because people know that something has gone wrong. So this is why we today now have what the book argues is a moral emergency. Um, and it's a sad day, in a way, to be having this conversation, you and I, today. Because today we had some shocking, absolutely shocking statistics that tell us that relative child poverty has now reached its all-time high, about 4.3 million children. We now have over 7 million families that are living in food insecurity. Here we are sitting together on an evening in the sixth richest country on earth, and seven million families are in food insecurity. And of course, this is what I see in my constituency in Birmingham. So as some of you will have read, I um, am the child of an alcoholic, and I lost my dad to what was a lifelong struggle with alcohol in, in 2015. And in the wake of, of that crisis, um, I was in a very, uh, very dark place. And one of the things that I did uh, after to help me uh, get back on my feet is I started working with the homeless community in Birmingham, the street homeless community in Birmingham. And one Sunday morning, we were, if you know Birmingham, we were just coming into the underpass by New Street Station uh, about 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning with one of the street kitchen teams that helps feed those uh, who are sleeping rough. And there we met a man who was a double amputee. He was crying in pain by his wheelchair. And he was still in his hospital gown with a hospital tag on his wrist. And he'd been there for two days. It took us four hours to get him an ambulance. We, for some years now, have had food banks in my constituency that, that have run out of food. So I have a member of staff now who has to help coordinate food collections. And you know, what you learn in a community like mine is the generosity of people who have almost nothing. So when we take food bank collection crates out to mosques and churches and schools, you know, we literally have children, nine-year-old children, who, who will take penguin bars out of their lunch boxes and put them in a food collection crate because they want other children to have what they have. I was at my A&E on Friday um, lobbying for some money to get the A&E rebuilt. It's like a war zone. We have 
hundreds of my constituents now being treated in corridors in A&E, with ambulances queued up around the block. And yet, that is not how the luckiest live in our country. The luckiest enjoy Rolls-Royce sales that have never been higher, super yacht sales that have never been higher. Uh, a luxury property on Fillmore Gardens will now cost you £27 million. And the book tells the story not just about what I see in my constituency. I go on a little explanation of a little tour, a little safari of, of how the other half live. Um, so, you know, going around the Rolls-Royce factory, that was an eye-opener. Um, if you, I don't know how many here have got a million quid to drop on a Rolls-Royce Phantom, but if you were in that position, you want it the colour of an Amazonian tree flog, you can have it. You want it to match the paint job on your private jets, yeah, they can do that for you. You can sit down on the hides of cows from the world's highest altitudes, which are used because there's no mosquitoes up there and there are no pockmarks uh, on the leather. We build super yachts in this country. A million person hours will go into building one of these crafts. It's what you might call the absurdity of affluence. And yet, and yet, the thing that troubles me most is not the conspicuous consumption, not the conspicuous consumption of things. It's the inconspicuous consumption of power. Because what I now see in Westminster today is money running through the corridors of power in a way that I have never seen before in 20 years. Think about, I don't know if there are any GB News watchers in the audience. <laughs> what, none? <laughs> GB News is funded by an interesting group of people who also put a lot of money into think tanks like the Legatum Institute. Um, individuals like this will run significant amounts of money into campaigns like Liz Truss's campaign. The amount of money and the sophistication of influence now in our country, driven by this wealth inequality, is something that is completely novel. And of course, what these funders are seeking to do is to shift the Overton window of debate to the right, to a libertarian view of the world, where we do not share in the way um, that we should. And so, you know, when you look at countries around the world, you see a few things in common, because inequalities of wealth very quickly become inequalities of power. And that is why unequal countries are unhappy countries, because they are poor, because people avoid paying their taxes. They are corrupt, because people buy influence. And they are stagnant, because social mobility collapses. And if we're honest with each other tonight, we can all see signs of those things happening. Social mobility in this country is now so bad, it takes the heirs of somebody born poor five generations to earn even average wages. Um, we have a £38 billion tax gap because of the level of, of tax avoidance. And, you know, when it comes to corruption, I don't need to say really more than three letters, which is PPE, um, which is not the stuff they teach here and at Oxford. It is um, it's one of the biggest procurement scandals that we've seen in this country. So the early signs are here, right? The early signs are here. This is what happens in countries where wealth inequality is high. But what you learn in my business is that things can always get worse. And, you know, I began my career in, um, in Millbank Tower in 1995. I worked for Tony Blair as part of that, um, that campaign team. We used to bounce to work thinking, singing things can only get better back in the early 90s. But actually, things can get worse. And wealth inequality is about to get worse. Nothing's forever, including the baby boomers. And as the baby boomers shuffle off this mortal coil, they are about to transfer five and a half trillion pounds to the next generation. Now, some will inherit fortunes, but some will inherit care bills. And so if you think wealth inequality is bad today, it is about to get far worse. And so if you are worried about the stability of our politics, about the future of justice, then we have got to have an urgent debate now about how we fix the trends that are dividing this country like never before. The good news is that most people now think that the, the gap in uh, wealth inequality is much too big. So about 70% of people say that the, um, the gap between rich and poor is too big. Slightly smaller number say that um, it, we should take action to reduce it. You've got a clear majority of people now in this country who believe that wealth inequality um, should be reduced. The question is, 
what we do about it. This was the challenge that Tony Atkinson set for Thomas Piketty uh, a few years ago. This is the 10th anniversary of Piketty's great book on capital. But we've got to now accelerate the debate about what it is we actually do about it. And so the back third of the book, which I'm going to rattle through really quickly now, is about some of the solutions that we might consider. And the intellectual uh, framework for this, if you like, is provided by uh, James Mead. Some of you will know James Mead, disciple of John Maynard Keynes, Nobel Prize winner, one of the most important progressive economists of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote a book which very few people have read and very few people in Westminster um, uh, have uh, heard of. But what he basically says is that if you want to fix wealth inequality, you've got to worry about these four things. You've got to worry about earned income, you've got to worry about how much people save, you've got to worry about people's returns on savings, and you've got to worry um, about tax. Now, who doesn't love a five-point plan? Uh, the five-point plan that the book proposes is you've got to have growth, not somewhere, but everywhere. You've got to act to raise earnings. I propose not universal basic income, but universal basic capital, underpinned by a Commonwealth fund and built by restoring fairness to the tax system. And I'm going to take you through these arguments very quickly. So, first, growth everywhere. If you're going to, if you're going to fix the inequality of wealth, you've got to raise the average level of wages. That means you've got to foster a faster growth of knowledge-intensive jobs, not just in London and the South East, but everywhere. At the moment, about half of the knowledge-intensive jobs in Britain are in London and the South East. We're creating very few of these jobs, about 100,000 each year. But the only way that we can fix this is through a radical process of devolution of power and resource to regions, to great cities like York, to Birmingham, to Manchester, that gives you the latitude to build the institutions that allow you to mobilise people, ideas and money. That is ultimately the only way that we can create the institutions in every part of this country that can foster a bigger supply and a faster supply of knowledge-intensive jobs. Second, we've got to then end the race to the bottom amongst British capitalism. We've actually got to change the way that companies work in this country to drive up the fraction of our national income that goes to wages as opposed to capital. But the reality is that many of you are funding those companies through the two trillion pounds of pension savings that we collectively own. Right now, it's really difficult for you to know whether you're investing in firms that are poisoning the planet or dodging their taxes or screwing their workers. So rolling up the pension funds that we have, making sure that you are genuinely empowered to invest in good companies rather than bad companies is one of the ways that we can create a force for good and what uh, people like Colin Hay have argued would be a civic capitalism. Making sure that we change company law so that there are things like workers on boards will be one of the ways in which we can make sure that companies are governed better too. Um, now, if you've got more uh, money coming in, you've then got to help people save. Um, there are lots of young people in the audience. I don't know how many feel that they're going to be anywhere near to buying a home anytime soon. People are shaking their head. We are becoming well, now an inheritocracy. And look, you're not short of advice. There are people like Kirsty Allsop who are around who can make useful suggestions like cancelling the gym membership, less money on Netflix, you know, maybe less of those kind of chai lattes and cappuccinos. Um, and of course, the best advice that anybody gave as a rejoinder to Kirsty Allsop is that if you wanted to move somewhere where property was a little bit cheaper, you basically needed to move back to the 1970s. And so we have got to try and make sure that people are able um, to save more because. Look, if you look at what's happened to the relationship between wealth and wages, back when I was born, wealth, national wealth, asset prices, therefore, was about three times um, national wages. Now it's ten times. What that means is that if you don't own assets today, it's almost impossible to earn enough to actually buy them. And so what the book proposes is a system of universal basic capital that entails universal savings accounts, your lifetime learning account, and an auto-enrolment pension account, connected together. Again, not novel. We've just finished a massive pilot of universal savings accounts through the National Endowment and Savings Trust. It's been a huge success. Why is it important? It's important because a quarter of people in our country have savings of less than £100. A quarter of people. And so creating a system like this is possible if we recognise that we have to redistribute more fairly the kinds of incentives that go into savings at the moment. So 
Richard Tippmann had a very useful phrase, which was fiscal welfare. If you look at the tax subsidies available to those who have assets already, it turns out they're enormous. There's, in fact, about 70 billion quid's worth of them. That's not far off the amount of money that we spend on universal credit. Here, here's the problem. All of those tax subsidies go to people who already have assets. It's the principle of to those that hath shall be given just a little bit more. And so thinking about how we restructure that, put it on a more progressive basis, so there's <coughs> savings matches and tax breaks for those who are trying to save their first couple of thousand pounds would make a big, big difference. But the truth is, for young people, there's something bigger that we're going to need to do. And so what the book proposes is for every 25-year-old, a one-off £10,000 dividend um, that is given as a savings match or as a tax break to help them get a foot on the housing ladder. £10,000 is about the average shortfall on a housing deposit. And we could afford that if we built a sovereign wealth fund. And again, not a novel idea. In fact, we could have done it here in this country back in the 70s and 80s. If we'd saved the proceeds of North Seed Oil all those years ago, you know how much the wealth fund would be today? About 500 billion pounds. That's how much we would have. But we gave that money away. So let's learn from the error of the past and join 80 countries around the world who are building sovereign wealth funds like the Norwegians. We need a fund of about <coughs> 200 billion in order to give a 10,000 pound uh, subsidy to every young person, a £10,000 dividend. It sounds a lot of money, but, you know, the state owns all kinds of weird stuff. Everything from, you know, the wine cellar underneath Lancaster House to all of the strange investments that we made during COVID. Uh, you know, that includes investments in football clubs through to equity stakes in a company that organises international sex parties called Killing Kittens. I mean, seriously, we invested in some weird shit during COVID. But rounding up, <laughs> what the state already owns, but then adding to it through the tax system would actually build a fund very quickly. Now, I don't know how many people here have read Rishi Sunak's tax return. What, none of you? Well, it is lucky I did it for you. Um, and here it is. And so a couple of things will stand out from this. Uh, the first thing is that the Prime Minister enjoys an income which is not unadjacent to £2 million. Um, but the second thing that will strike you is how much tax he pays on this. Because, of course, Rishi Sunak pays a tax rate of 23%. So at a time when one in five people are paying 40%, Rishi Sunak on 2 million a year is paying 23%. Now, why is that? Well, it's because if you look at how investment income has grown this, um, this century, you've now got about 80 billion in investment income that comes in each year. Um, the problem is that 60% of it goes to the top 10%. And it's taxed at half the rate of tax that a senior lecturer would pay here. So you've got these kind of crazy inequities now in the tax system. And if we remedied them through thinking about a whole range of different wealth taxes more creatively, you could begin building that sovereign wealth fund um, very, very quickly. So, that's the agenda. Building creative states, civic capitalism, universal basic capital, commonwealth fund, tax code that reflects our moral code. These are all ideas that have been tried and tested somewhere and which could work here. And maybe they're the wrong ideas, but that's the provocation that I offer you. If there are better ideas, let's have it out, let's have the debate, and let's try and zero in on ideas that people won't simply just like on social media, but will actually vote for at a general election. Final point I wanted to make is a word of optimism. Because as difficult as things are today, some extraordinary things are going to happen over the next 20 and 30 years. We are at the brink of, on the brink of multiple revolutions in genetic medicine, artificial intelligence, global gigabit connectivity, the shift to green power and green energy. Together, these things are going to add maybe 100 trillion pounds of output by 2060. There is going to be extraordinary new wealth that is created. And if we share that fairly, we could give each and every one of us agency, options, opportunity and freedom that are unimaginable today. The question is, are we going to recognise that there are no new freedoms without security? 
And there's no real security without wealth. There is no progress for each and every one of us unless we try and restore an idea that's as old as Plato, which is the wealth-owning democracy. So I hope this book gives you food for thought. And I'm really looking forward to some of your reflections tonight. Thank you very much. I talked for too long. Guess what? No, you're OK. Politicians. <laughs> we'll do 15 do minutes of chat, and then we'll go to the audience for, for 15 minutes, I think. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, your book is great as well. So I'm going to start with a really personal question, I think. Um, I did love the picture of you in your little jersey. <laughs> <clears throat> so how did a boy like you get to be an MP who can write with such authority about so many aspects of the state? Because I have to say, and I hope you won't think this is rude, that I quite often meet MPs who I feel do not have the same grasp of what is needed in government. So where's that come from? And how rare is it? Well, that's a very difficult question. So it, 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 it is unusual. And, you know, what um, people will recognise reading the book is that I am, of course, um, a struggling academic who was not clever enough to go into academia and so um, went into politics instead. Um, but I suppose the... You know, I've, I'm lucky enough that I've, I've been around for a long time. I've been in politics now since I joined the Labour Party when I was 15. Um, I've, had, I've been lucky enough, I mean, I went to always a pretty violent and terrible comprehensive school, but, you know, I was lucky enough to, to get a Fulbright scholarship to study in the States. Um, and I'm just curious. But the, 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 there, are, there are two things that really kind of energise people who write books like this. One is curiosity and one is, and one is damage. And so the, the, the curiosity comes from having to confront people in extreme distress in the constituency and wanting to find answers to the predicaments that you can't solve there, there and then. So that's where the hunger comes from. But the, you know, the, the, the truth is that um, a lot of politicians um, who you know, try and change the world and perfect things and, and put things to better use um, have had some kind of experience of childhood trauma. And, and that was my... In case I didn't recognise that being the child of an alcoholic was a thing until actually after my dad died. Um, it was only then that I really had the kind of um, space, time, um, interest in kind of reflecting on that. Um, and, it, and, and if you've gone through all different kinds of childhood trauma, you, you, often, you often develop, um, you, you're often trying to put the world to rights because you've had, that's how you've had to grow up as a kid. Um, you've often developed some armour plating because you've had to protect yourself and, and build protection systems, um, and you become a bit obsessive. Um, and I'm fortunate I have all of those all things. All of those things. It's not necessarily a happy story, it's not necessarily a happy answer, but that's probably the psychology of it, I think. So when you take this sort of deep knowledge of how things work and how they need to change to your party, yeah. are they listening to you? Do they understand what you're saying, or do eyes glaze over? No, eyes don't glaze over. Okay. Um, there is sometimes a bit of sighing, uh, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, so people know, everybody knows that this is a problem. And where we are now in, in the political cycle is what, what does Labour need to do and say to win? And then what do we need to do in, in office? And one of the things that I can see happening at the moment is, for all sorts of reasons, Labour is going to be really cautious and the, and the risk is that in trying to maximise the majority, it undermines the mandate that you've got in office. Now, the, the book is deliberately written as a three-term project. It's not written as a kind of a manifesto. And having been in government, the thing that I can recognise is that unless you start work on these ideas, like on day one, they're never ready for the second manifesto. And if you look at the big change manifesto since 1945, so... 1945, 64, 79, 97. Each of those manifestos only uses the word radical once. Mm. It's very often the second and third manifesto that really leans into um, a radical settlement. But you don't get to offer that radical proposal unless you start the work straight away. So I guess what I'm trying to do is to light up the injustice of this now, but also say, look, there are ways to fix this. This isn't 
you know, this isn't inevitable. And by the way, if we don't get a handle on this now, it's about to get much, much worse. So that's the peril that we're now in. But, you know, we're a, <coughs> Labour is a, you know, it's, it's a coalition of people who thirst for a better society. And so building that kind of grassroots understanding, that grassroots energy, that grassroots anger about some of the, I, these ideas is, 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 like, really important right now. Do you think it also is going to need visionary leadership, though? And is that visionary leadership going to be there for that second manifesto? I think, or that second I, think, I, think it, I think it will, but I mean, I think <laughs> that, that Labour is so battle scarred by the defeats that we've had and, you know, frankly, the experience that many of us have had over the last 14 years in serving constituencies through the long mm. years of austerity, the hunger to win now and throw this lot out is what it conquers every other kind of emotion right now. But you know, Tony Blair said this to me when I started work for him back in the, in the 90s. Politics is ultimately a battle of ideas. And you've got to have better ideas than the other side. And you've got to show those ideas work. And so by, by kind of setting out a set of ideas that fit together as a system, what, what I'm hoping to do is to galvanise change. I like your smorgasbord of ideas, which Karen referred to earlier. You know, I am deeply worried that the wealth tax has already been... Um, yeah, constrained. Off, off the table and yeah. constrained. So I think that's probably worrying a, um, a lot of us in the audience. When we look at the past and we think about... Um, Richard and I were talking about this this morning, about um, death duties, you know, and how, how those shifted the, yeah. the dial on wealth inequality. And then we had super tax, and, mm. and that shifted the dial. Leadership brought those about mm. at some point... And do you think we're going to be able to do that again in, so, a, in a coherent way? So I think we could be, um, for, for two reasons. So first, doing tax policy in opposition is, is an error because you can never have the models, you can never have the numbers. Crucially, you can never calculate who the losers are going to be and so you can't figure out your damage limitation. So you've got to do tax policy in government. But the second point is there's actually a huge range of options here. Mm. So, reform of inheritance tax, equalising capital gains and tax, something so radical that Nigel Lawson did it, charging, national in, um, charging NICs on investment income, um, non-DOMs, um, something that actually both sides now agree on, um, potentially a 1% tax on the 22,000 fortunes worth over 10 million, reform of property, cap, uh, property taxes like council tax, um, I mean, you, you're already up to sort of quite a long list of potential options, but what is under-researched now is the political support levels and how they change depending on how you frame things. So framing, we know that framing effect has a huge impact on, on the narrative and on support for tax, um, but it is, it's only now through the work of people like Aaron Avani and Andy Summers on the Wealth Tax Commission, and Ben Ansell's done some good work on this at Nuffield, um, uh, Demos has got a good project running on inheritance tax. Um, the OECD actually is about to start mm. an interesting piece of work on wealth taxes. So it, it's actually only now that we're beginning to crystallise what are the specific measures. And we've now got, I think, quite a lot of political research to do um, about how you poll on those, how you frame those, how you focus group those, so that they're oven ready for government. But you've got to remember, I mean, the, you know, the... <sighs> The public finance, I mean, I thought the public finances were tight in 2010, infamously. You know, now they're just so, so much worse. And you're going to need taxes, not just for, you know, lovely ideas like mine. The essentials guarantee that we talked about, that JRF and Trussell Trust have developed, that's about 22 billion quid. Mm -hmm. Universal childcare, fixing the NHS. I mean, just, you know, the, the, the list goes on. So how do we get that public conversation that in a sense you're trying to provoke as well as mm. as well as one in within the House of Parliament. In the face of our media, how do we get the public to have intelligent conversations about where we might go mm. as a country? When you do your polling, mm. you're finding a really sensible prevailing yeah. sort of com common sense about, about what's needed. Mm. And yet that's not what we see on our television screens or on social media or in our broadcast media. Mm. How do we overcome that so that actually 
we can have a grown-up debate in this country about mm. what we need? This is such a great question. So we, as you know, we, we ran a big poll on the all-party group on inclusive growth um, last year to look at where the consensus was between left and right on a, on a whole range of 38 different measures. And, and on wealth taxes, there was a remarkable amount of consensus between both left and right about a 1% tax on fortunes worth over 10 million. I was completely taken aback by, um, by the results. So you've got to basically do the donkey work of polling, uh, policy design, polling, framing in focus groups. But then, frankly, you've got to have politicians who are kind of prepared to be outriders for this, who are prepared to work cross-party, um, but who are prepared to go and provoke the conversation in public. And, you know, these are potentially quite big changes. Um, and so they, they will take a, a few years, I think, to become something that the public just thinks, well, we haven't done that already, you know. But I think the public is there now because they know things are going so badly And do you think wrong. that's particularly true of young people? I know you write in the book about being very impressed by, yeah. by young people. But this is such a key point. So in, a couple of people have said to me that um, you have to remember that to an extent we live in a gerontocracy. So uh, this next election, perhaps 40% of voters will be over 55 um, the biggest fact in British politics is that Labour lost the over 65s by 3 million in the last election. Now, what, what does that tell you? It, it tells you that change needs you to build a coalition between many people who are in the top 10% and people who are in the bottom 90%. Now, what does that mean in real life? It means building coalitions between grandparents and grandchildren because... I think about a quarter of the over 65s now, on paper, are millionaires. Um, and so unless you can build coalitions between those grandparents and grandchildren, you're not going to get stuff that people are going to vote for. Now, this is why the wealth fund is such an interesting thought, because when I've had these debates um, since we've taken the book on the road, I've had a lot of people kind of say to me, look, I'm retired. We've done quite well. We think we're lucky. We would be prepared to pay a bit more tax. But you know what? I don't want to give it to the government that is just going to waste it. If you change the argument and say, well, what if that money went into something that sounded quite a lot like the National Trust um, and it was basically ring-fenced to provide dividends to young people to help them get a house? The political support level is transformed. So I think, you know, the Treasury obviously hates hypothecated taxation, but we, we, we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good here. And if, and if we think we've basically got to build a political coalition between those that have done well over the last 30 years and those who have got a pretty bleak 30 years ahead of them, how do we make that coalition happen? And the argument against doing that, you know, that young people will waste it, um, you give them £10,000 and, you, you know, yeah. it will take it away. I've been um, taking part in the research that is evaluating the Welsh Government's basic income mm. pilot where, I don't know if people know about this, um, young people who are leaving care in Wales are being given £1,600 a month for two years between the ages of 18 and 20 to help them in that transition to young adulthood. And a lot of people who were opposed to that argued that they would just... Go on holiday. Waste it, go on holiday, yeah. buy drugs. Yeah. Um, a few people refused signing up to it because they said, no, I will just spend it on drugs, so don't give me the mm. money, which is completely not, not the response that people thought. But they are astonishingly sensible with it. They are saving. They are buying driving lessons so they can get a job. They are investing in their education. They are helping to support their birth families yeah. often. They're doing all the things with it that middle-class children do with the money they get from yeah. their parents. So I actually feel that that pilot might help provide useful evidence for those who argue that that kind of investment in young people in that transition to adulthood mm. would not be a good investment. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's brilliant because it, it helps light up, um, again, how evidence and framing can make a big difference. So, so the idea of a £10,000 dividend isn't, isn't my idea. You know, that was the Intergenerational mm -hmm. um, Commission on Fairness that David Willits chaired, who was a Conservative. Um, now, they proposed giving that £10,000 dividend as cash. Um, and we did some polling on that that said, well, look, 
What happens if you give it not as cash, but as a savings match or as a tax break? If you give it as cash, actually, you get a net negative support level. If you give it as a savings match or as a tax break, support levels go up to like 60%. So again, we've just got to be thoughtful about how we craft this policy um, in a way that can help us build those kind of coalitions for the future. But people, people I come back to this point, people know something's wrong. Mm. People know things are going in the wrong direction. Um, and so the market for ideas is there in a way now that I've not seen, frankly, since the early 90s. I'm starting to see a lot of books coming through that are mm. pointing the finger at neoliberalism. Yep. You know, about time, people might say. But, yep. you know, they're, they're starting to, to sort of come along. Um, and there's always a sort of story that goes around neoliberalism is that we got that because a bunch of people cleverly went and plotted at Mount Montpellier. Yeah, indeed. You know, and that they secretly sort of sat aside and figured out how to influence the direction of society. Do we need to do that? Definitely. Definitely. Because, as, as you and I know, there is a vast right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> but at the moment, it's now being fueled by people who have very, very serious money, who, as it happens, all live offshore, um, but are now really quite sophisticated in how they influence the debate. Think tanks, TV news channels, national newspapers, leadership candidates. It's an incredibly sophisticated system. And of course, our election laws are wide open. So you can take foreign cash into the bank account of a UK citizen and then donate it to a political party. It's perfectly legal. Um, so we, 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 our democracy is kind of wide open to this kind of abuse. Um, so we, we've definitely got to get a bit more organised now. I mean, not least because we've now learned a lot more about the economics of inequality. So what the, the middle core of the book um, is about, I guess, what I learned about how New Labour's economic model is no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. And, and there's been no kind of John Maynard Keynes in, in the last kind of 10 to 15 years, but the neo schumpeterians and the new institutional economists and the behavioural economists, together they have now told us a story about how privilege very quickly becomes rents, how um, creative destruction often means the destruction of competition, um, and when you get asset price booms, you get a bust, and the rich recover from that fastest from the poor. And if you put those kind of waves together, you get an inexorable trend towards inequality. And, and none of that thinking was there in no. New Labour's original and do you think economic that, models. Do you think that new economic thinking is really seeping through to where it needs to reach? I think it's reach. beginning to. I mean, Rachel's May's lecture this week was a very good piece of work, very thoughtful, very deep, and reflects sort of quite close reading. And you can now, be, you can absolutely begin to see some of those traces there. So her critique of our reliance on financial service taxes, for example. Um, and actually some of the, you know, the thinkers that are leading on this are people like Secretary Yellen in the United States, um, some of the people that were around Joe Biden when he was vice president are really important. And you know, this is not a novel set of economic thoughts. I mean, some of the Americans have been thinking and working on this for you know, 20 years now. But we, we haven't, we definitely haven't taken over the mainstream of progressive economics yet. That, that is still job not yet done. You Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair. I mean, I think we're starting to see the principles of that new economic thinking perhaps being more widely yeah. known. Um, but still, I think not seeing large government in large countries mm. shifting towards that kind of thinking, mm. but in smaller countries. That's true. Mm -hmm. and, that's and you do talk in your book about there being places around the world where things, good things are happening. And mm. I wondered what, who strikes you as, as, as doing it best? Where should we be emulating most? So I don't, oddly enough, I don't think there are, especially countries, I think there's more policy innovation now at city and state level. Yeah. Um, that is where I think some of the real thinking is going on. I mean, obviously one returns to some of the systems that they've got in places like Sweden, but there are particular German states, for example, that have got industrial policy down to 
a fine art, but you couldn't say that about the entire country. Mm. You'd have to look at sort of particular states. Um, increasingly, you know, I, I look east for policy innovation. So you look to new country, you look, you look to younger countries like Singapore or South Korea um, that are just developing some really interesting thoughts kind of very, very quickly. Um, and we have to do a better job on the left in Britain actually at looking to the east for some of these ideas rather than just assuming that we just need to go to Scandinavia all the time. Obviously, that is completely our comfort zone and we all love Scandinavia. Um, but, you know, what, what the Singaporeans have been doing with sovereign wealth funds, for example, and how they've used the dividends to um, fund individual learning accounts, for example, that's really quite, that's quite interesting stuff. Um, so people are developing these wealth transfer mechanisms in, in quite novel ways um, around the world. And so we can pick and, pick and choose from, yeah, from different places. Ex exactly. But I think you know, what, what I loved about James Mead is that he kind of gives you a system into which you can kind of connect things. And, you, and <laughs> the truth is you can't fix wealth inequality unless you cover each one of the Mead dimensions. You can't just do one bit without doing the other bits. So in, in your book you, and in your talk tonight, you talked about um, war and revolution <laughs> as, as historically the forces that perhaps have, have made countries recognise the need to become more, more equal. What, what Rich and I have been thinking a lot and writing about recently are environmental issues and the climate yeah. emergency yeah. as also something that requires attention to inequality, mm. where inequality is, is a central aspect of, of what, what we need to tackle before we're able to tackle the climate emergency mm. for, lots of, for lots of reasons. And I wondered if you yeah. thought about the environment and, and the climate emergency in relation so this is, to wealth inequality So this is particular. definitely the sequel, I think. Ah, is, okay. um, and it's, so I would say it, the, the weakest aspect of the book is on, is on climate, and, and that's because we took an editorial decision that we just wouldn't be able to do it justice um, in the pages. And that has, and so there, were, there are two bits that are missing. So one is um, an, an, an adequate reflection on Kate Rowell's work about donor economics and actually setting good environmental limits. Actually, if you look at this framework of rights up here, so this is, this is actually from a piece of work I did for the Fabians last year to try and figure out, okay, well, what would be the freedoms that you'd actually ask for? And actually, if you, if you sort of sketch out things like the right to nature, the right to health, I mean, hugely, all of this is hugely informed by um, uh, Richard and your work, actually. Um, you can see how you could actually incorporate ecological limits into this. The, the one bit that we, that we actually had to cut out of the book was the section on carbon taxes. Um, and so the, the book on tax covers carpet bagging and capital, and it was going to cover carbon, um, but it was just, it's, it's too big. So that's probably the next thing that I'll publish is um, something on carbon taxes. Because, of course, mm. you know, if you're flying a private jet around the world, well, do you know what? It's got quite a big carbon footprint. And, and you know, we have to get into a position where, you know, having a big carbon footprint is, is as socially unacceptable as drink driving. And so thinking about how you structure a whole set of intelligent carbon taxes now is really quite difficult, but really super important. I've talked longer and you've talked longer than we should have done. So now we need to switch uh -oh. and take some questions from the audience. Um, if you could raise your hands and we'll have time for a few and we've got a microphone that will be coming around. So if you could wait till the microphone comes to you. Thank you. That was lucky. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons I suppose the UK is attractive to money and to this kind of power is the lack of transparency. Um, and that and transparency enables not only the government but also civil society, academics, researchers to turn the analysis of wealth not from some sort of pickety, arcane art but to something we can more easily access. What are some of the things that you think the government can do to make wealth and inequality in the UK much more transparent, accessible, and acknowledgeable? Mm, great question. Um, shall we take a couple more and then ask Liam to answer those? Um, can we go to, I was going to say the lady with her hand up waving. Thank you. And then we'll go to, to your microphone over there. Thank 
Thank you. I think as a society, we've become more individualistic. So my question is, how do we get to the point where the wealthy and the privileged see a value in supporting the poor and the value that the poor provide to them at the top? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. And the third question. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of um, solve. Sorry, sorry, start again. Uh, in terms of sovereign wealth funds, is this echoing a bit? It's working. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, in terms of sovereign wealth funds, you um, you mentioned a couple of things. You said that um, the UK um, sort of missed the boat on that one in terms of the oil boom and that we should learn from it. Um, but you also said that there were about 80 sovereign wealth funds around the world. Now, I, like a lot of people, probably think of a couple off the top of my head, um, sort of Norway, um, some of the Gulf states, and that's largely on oil. I wondered if you could just talk a bit about whether there's any common themes with sovereign wealth funds in terms of where the impetus has come from for creating them, um, what resources that wealth has been derived from, because I presume it's not just oil, and if there's similarities in the country, because Norway with a small population is completely different to an autocratic yeah. country in the Gulf state. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got transparency, individualism and sovereign wealth. Brilliant. Funds. So on transparency, the, the, the quickest and simplest thing you can do is require everyone to publish their tax return. Um, and very few countries do this. Norway is one of them. Um, it provides an incredible amount of very useful data. Um, that helps you understand a lot of the kind of wealth dynamics. But even if you didn't go that far, um, ensuring that we drive through transparency of offshore land would make a big step forward. So Margaret Hodge and I work very closely together in um, Westminster on this. And we are making a bit of progress, but still overseas territories not publish their registers of beneficial ownership. Um, we still have this weird new creation called limited partnerships where you can basically disguise all kinds of assets. And these things are outrageous, right? So these things are being used to launder money stolen from people around the world. And much of this money, a lot of this money, is being used to fund things like the invasion of Ukraine. So, and the UK is the, one of the global epicenters of this. So I'm quite annoyed about this. And so I ran a session for the Business and Trade Committee not long ago where I got the Serious Fraud Office, HMRC, and the head of the National Crime Agency on a panel. I said to the guy from the, N from the NCA, right, is Britain still now one of the world's favorite centers of economic crime? Answer, yes. Are we a top 10 destination? Yes. Are we a top five destination? Yes. It wouldn't go any further than that. <laughs> but I mean, this should be outrageous. This should outrageous that we are one of the world's favourite places for economic crime and that we permit these offshore trusts and limited partnerships which are used to fund autocrats around the world as well as buy up significant chunks of central London. It's outrageous and we should end it. And that, if I could, even if I couldn't get people publishing their tax returns, if I could drive transparency through that under the next government, then I would feel it was time well used. Um, so on this point about individualism versus um, uh, collectivism, this is such an important point. So, but there are some good people now who are thinking about really clever ways in which you can basically mobilise shame in order to get people to behave well. Now, shame is an evolutionarily very important instinct. People like Brooke Harrington, who's a brilliant professor of economic anthropology at Dartmouth, you know, makes an argument that I'm almost bought into that actually, if you can use, if, if you can persuade people to eat Tide Pods with social media, then actually you might be able to shame people into doing the right thing on their taxes. And one of the best lines I have heard in politics is from patriotic millionaires with who have a brilliant strap line, patriots pay their taxes. And I just think that there are now social movements amongst those who are very rich that are providing lots of really quite interesting um, campaign ideas for, for how you can begin sort of changing this way of behaviour. Now, I would never fully trust that. I think you've also got to change laws and you've got to change tax rates. But I, but I think there is definitely something in this. And then on self sovereign wealth funds, so this is the, the list. Um, these are the numbers. Um, lots of these are obviously funded by natural resource booms. Now, 
what is the great natural resource that we've got in this country? We're better to talk about this than here in York. It's intellectual capital. So the creation of patent funds, for example, um, making sure that there is kind of co-ownership where the state has helped fund intellectual property, making sure that we retain a stake in that, that is actually, I think, one of the fastest ways in which we can build um, <coughs> these kind of funds in this country. But it is, uh, it, uh, we do own some pretty crazy stuff. Um, and lots of it is still in the Crown Estate. So, you know, the seabed out to the 12-mile limit, uh, the riverbeds, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all owned by the state. And actually, you know, we, we just don't corral it and manage it very effectively. In, in fact, our governance of assets is uh, currently run, it's coordinated by a shady organisation called UKGI, UK Government Investments. And, of course, their most infamous investment is the post office. They have been... <laughs> There is one, the post office, you and I own the post office. Uh, the, our representative on the board of the post office is the UKI board director. Have they done a good job? Arguably not. So the way, the way that we govern these investments has got to change for the future. Thank you. We are at time. Do you think we have one more round, Karen? Yeah. 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 All right, so we have gentlemen at the back, down at the front. And then here at the front. How about that? Three. Ladies, hands up, please. You didn't do it. So I've got three, three questions from men. Maybe they just wave more. Right. Um, kind of far away. Um, to be much more radical, um, your suggestions are far from radical in view of the new economics that's happening. 97% of money is produced by private banks. That should be shifted back to the central banks. Um, they've been trying since 1929 to do it, and they failed miserably. Um, that's the funding of the housing boom in the UK. If they shifted the ownership of the banks, uh, the money production back to the uh, central bank, uh, we wouldn't have the situation in 2008 where the government's bailing out the banks for uh, uh, misuse of funds. Um, modern, modern management theory, uh, Stephanie Kilton, um, in that the governments can produce as much money as they want, they can spend as much money as they want. Um, it's, it changes uh, the dynamics of economics completely. Um, so we want some radical ideas. Um, there's an organisation called Positive Money um, that has some very good radical, I radical ideas. Um, if you talk about that. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and our second microphone, where did that do? Thank you. Jeff Beacon, Pollution Tax Association. I'm glad you mentioned carbon taxes. Um, the rise in Earth's energy imbalance has been enormous over the past uh, two decades, and it's very worrying indeed. Um, but in your constituency, you have areas where the average carbon footprint is about three tonnes a year. Mm. Um, you have other parts of Birmingham have got 15 to 20 tonnes a year. And is there any chance of using some shame on these people that um, in, your, in, in your area and in our area that fly too much, drive too much and eat too much mm. beef and uh, dairy and as a corollary some of the, the, the richer people have obviously increased their wealth enormously through housing or the right to have a house on a plot of land is mm. uh, the, the, what, what's interesting there um, I, uh, I did some work on the ONS figures a couple of years ago, and it seems to be about 50% of um, national wealth, 42% of mm. which is owned by households and 8% yeah. by uh, yeah. corporations. Now, the Attlee government did try and claw back some of the uh, increase in property values mm. when planning permission is given, rather. Mm. Any thoughts doing that again? Yeah. 
Thank you. And the last one. Thank you. Um, I feel like a Radio 4 News presenter where the last question is yeah. always the slightly jokey one. Um, <laughs> the, it, you've clearly won the argument. I don't see how anyone could counteract anything that you said, but the trouble is, is that people often don't vote for it. Yeah. And the problem is, is that the Tories seem to have almost a complete... They've cornered the market in charisma. Nigel Farage and Boris uh, started with Maggie. Perhaps you might tell me that Tony Blair was a slight um, uh, exception to that rule. But where are the charismatic Labour politicians who are going to win the votes with these ideas? Thank you. <laughs> Sitting right in front of you. Exactly. You can see. Look no further. So we've got radical ideas like yeah. modern monetary theory. Um, what do we do about people who consume too much? And... Um, where are the charismatic leaders? <laughs> so um, let me start. Um, so I, I think the argument on um, modern monetary theory has still got a way to go, actually, before we can get it into a way that we could explain it on, on a doorstep in a way that is plausible. I mean, the, um, one, one of the striking features, however, in the debate has got to be that we have just put £850 billion into the monetary system in quantitative easing. That's knocked about 1% off interest rates. And guess what? If you were lucky enough to own assets, you just had a windfall. And do you know what? If you then tax that windfall at 20%, not 40%, guess what? Wealth inequality grows um, really radically. But I think the, the arguments that, and I have this argument with um, a few people who are advocates of um, MMT, um, the, the bit of the argument that is still missing are the, are the safeguards around the inflationary impact. And, and that is where I think we have still got an argument um, and, to, and to go at, basically. And I, I, don't, I don't think we've yet got that argument in a place where the inflationary safeguards are clear enough um, in a way that we could sell it on, on a doorstep. Um, on carbon footprints, I mean, this... Um, and I think you're kind of... You were aiming at land taxes as well, uh, perhaps. So um, I think... The, the way that we obviously tax property today is, is, is mad. Um, the fact that you've got average rates of tax on property in Kensington that is way, way lower than it is in, say, Blackpool is, is crazy. And the book says that you, you can't avoid the conclusion that you are just going to have to build more homes. And if you build more socially affordable homes, then you're going to provide housing services to people who need it today. I would say how, housing... After 20 years as an MP, housing is still the number one casework issue um, for me um, because private rents are just sort of going up and up and up and through the roof. Um, but you can't simply build your way out of the problem. You've also got to make sure that people have got the financial wherewithal if they want to, to, to buy a home too. On, on carbon footprints, though, I think we're in, our, we're in our infancy and we are going to have to move quite quickly, I think, to in the direction that you suggest... If, if we're to kind of harness the power of shame in persuading people, frankly, to behave um, more um, in, in a more socially minded way. And, and here again, I mean, this, this, this is where I am sort of quite inspired by um, the younger generation. I've just finished running a Generation Earthshot competition in 16 Hodge Hill schools. Um, just mind blowing ideas. All, practically all of the schools in my constituency have now got eco councils. And the passion and the eloquence that a nine-year-old child can, in Alan Rock can bring to this debate is still one of the most inspiring things that I have seen in, in public life. So a few of us in Parliament at the moment are having a debate about how do we, how do we, how do we create more strategic long-term thinking in government? Because it's broken, completely broken at the moment. And one of the conclusions I think we're coming to is that we've got to create these kind of intergenerational commissions where we create platforms for young people in Parliament, a bit like the Future Commission has in, in Wales, or the Commission on Futures has in Wales. Um, we've, we have got to use citizens' assemblies in a more imaginative way, but, but we've got to try and find this in a way that brings generations together, because I think that the real breakthroughs in public policy are going to come through recrafting these intergenerational bargains. And if we can do that in a way that is actually in Parliament, so there are 
platforms in Parliament for these debates, then frankly our politics will be um, an awful lot better. Um, and the, um, the, the invitation to comment on the charisma of the front bench is, uh, is, is a great invitation that I'm going to dodge um, <laughs> because ult ultimately, you know, what, what is important is, is power. And, you know, what I do think is that our party has gone from a pretty significant deficit to a pretty significant advantage in what is a really kind of short space of time. But the, the peril of moving so fast in such a short space of time um, is that you don't always have the time to do the thinking. And as somebody who's been around a long time and has made enough mistakes of my own and is kind of old enough and ugly enough now to uh, offer a bit of advice, um, I would just say that we need more people who think and write and have arguments like the brilliant argument that we've had tonight. Thank you, Liv. So it's been 15 years, actually, since we published The Spirit Level. 15 years. 15 That's years. Incredible. And um, in that time, inequality has moved onto the political stage. Um, and your book, I think, helps make a but, but many of the things that you predicted there. as well yeah. have unfolded. Yeah. So now is the time for action. So thank you, and I'm going to hand over to, to Karen to finish the evening for us. Thank you. So I'm just going to say a very few words um, before I hope you will join us all for drinks in the foyer, and Liam will be outside too to continue the conversation. We've got our wonderful independent bookseller, Fox Lane Books, with some copies that Liam will sign if you would like as well. Um, but for, before you go to that, I want to thank Susan Thorne and Sarah Mitchell and the other events team, our camera operator here today, for putting on such a successful event. I want to thank Kate for sharing her expert insight and hosting the discussion and the q and A. I I want to thank all of you for coming along and engaging with some very great questions. Um, but last but not least, of course, huge thanks to Liam for coming here to discuss his ideas for fixing the wealth divide. And I've, I personally very much hope that the policies are adopted and put into practice for all the reasons he so powerfully sets out. So please join me in a final round of applause for our, for our speaker, Liam Bell. <laughs>